Hello, everybody. We're near the Pentecost season as I start this message, and we know Pentecost pictures the smaller harvest, the small group of people God has called at this time as first fruits of his spiritual harvest. When I say first fruits, I could also say disciples, for that's what we're being called to be. When we talk about Jesus, disciples, who do we normally think of? I think most of us would think of Peter, James, John, Matthew, Judas, and the ones we read of in the Bible. And I think most of us, when we think of it more carefully, realize that there actually were other disciples besides the twelve. In fact, one time Jesus sent out seventy as a picture of what was going to go out to all the world. Remember the seventy nations of Genesis? In Acts 1.15, it says Peter stood up and spoke to 120 disciples of Jesus Christ. And we know there were also many female disciples also. This is not a message just for the men. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene, um, Mary the mother of Jesus, Martha, Mary the sister of Lazarus, a lot of Marys, and others like Timothy's mother Eunice, his grandmother Lois, Lydia, Yodia, Syntyche, however you say that name, the first converts in Philippi, Acts 9.36 even calls Tabitha, who was also called Dorcas, a disciple, as there were also disciples named Priscilla and Phoebe, the deaconess who delivered the epistle of Romans to the church there. Now in Acts 1.14, it says, in Acts 1.14, let me just turn there first. Acts 1.14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, it's the next verse that says, where it talks about Peter addressing 120 disciples, which included many women disciples as well. So if you're a man and somehow think that all the disciples were men, you've got to get over it. It's not true. Many of the best disciples, in fact, were women. Other than John, it seems like the men deserted Jesus at, at the cross. The women disciples were the ones who hung in there with him at his darkest hour. So you women are absolutely disciples as well. I want you to listen carefully. The earliest disciples, in the strictest sense of the word, meant people who followed Christ. He calls them. They drop what they're doing. They follow him with no reservation, no pause, no delay. They begin following a new master. After all, we can't serve two masters. They're not called anything else but disciples. In fact, in the gospel accounts, they're not referred to by anything else. That's it. Disciples. That's what they're called. They're not even called Christians until many years later in Antioch, which we read about in Acts 11.26. The words disciple and disciples, plural, are used a total of 290 times in the New Testament. So it seems that the topic, that the name, the label, must be important. Are you a disciple? A disciple, a follower of Christ? Are you sure? Are you sure you know what it means to be a disciple of Christ? Do you know the cost, the accountability, what's involved, what the rewards are? Now, the people we read about in the Bible are followers of Christ. And by the way, in the earlier going, the early disciples were very human. They slept when Jesus asked them to watch and pray. They flee from an armed band coming to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We read that in Matthew 26, the end of it, instead of sticking with him. So they weren't perfect. They were disciples, though, nonetheless. And they changed the world forever. Those early disciples changed the world, brethren. And if we learn and follow their example, we too can still change the world forever. Or we can be disciples in name only and do very little. So are you and am I a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ? You realize very few are being chosen to be disciples. It's part of the meaning of the Pentecost season. Many are called and few are chosen. Jesus prayed all night before choosing the twelve disciples. All night long. We can read that in Luke 6, verses 12 and 13. And do you realize that a lot of care was taken in picking you? That you, with the foreknowledge of God, were also hand-picked. I'm going to give a, another sermon about our high calling. I'm going to go more in detail there uh, about the specialness of our calling in that particular message. But anyway, right now you have been chosen as a modern-day disciple. 
That's very special. Out of billions who have ever been born, you were chosen by God our Father to be the disciple, a child of God today, to be part of the very bride of Christ, part of the first fruits, the Creator Himself, the great I am who I am, Yahweh in heaven, has put your name in the eternal dream team of heaven, in the book of life. It's an opportunity few have been offered, one that will never be repeated. It is an opportunity some have been offered and have scorned and walked away from. So it's been offered to you and me now. We are the ones who are mentioned in Matthew 22 that the first one's offered, turn it down. Let's not turn it down. We must not treat it lightly. Twelve of those early disciples became the twelve apostles, whose names will be engraved for all eternity on the twelve foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem. What an honor. Are you a disciple? Does God know you as a disciple? Are you a true disciple? We mustn't be a secret disciple like Joseph of Arimathea was up until at least the time that he took Jesus' body and put it in his own tomb. But it says in John 19.38 that he was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. But at least he seems to have overcome that by offering his burial plot or a burial tomb. And uh, Nicodemus may have also been a secret disciple. Don't be ashamed to be a follower of Christ. In fact, Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of him in front of my father and the angels. He says that in Luke 9. I'm not turning to all these early ones. I want to get through this introduction and, and read the, the verses that have to do with being a disciple. I want us to really think about this topic as we go through it, determine if we need to come out of the closet more and be an open, true disciple of our King and our Master, Jesus Christ. There were disciples who were also false disciples. I don't want to be a false disciple. They were the, there to see the miracles, to get the free food, to follow a man they thought would free them from the Romans. Many of these left when the times got tough or when Jesus disappointed them in some way. Jesus, in fact, gave signs now of what a disciple would be like, would look like, uh, what conduct uh, we could see in a disciple, what feelings we could feel from a disciple, signs we could recognize in a disciple if we were looking for modern-day disciples of Christ. And just being able to preach, being able to do signs and wonders would not be enough. Jesus said many would come even prophesying and doing miracles in his name, and he would say he never knew them. So it's possible to take on the name of Jesus Christ and not even be a disciple. That's concern I'd have. Today, that is what I want to talk about, the five clear signs Jesus gave to recognize his true modern-day disciples and followers. And, of course, you can immediately begin to discern with these points whether or not you and I are disciples. There wasn't just one sign. I think many people are familiar with the one sign of being a disciple, but there actually were many, as we'll see. Many scriptures. We'll look at five, where Jesus gave a point and then said, this is what makes you a disciple. This is what makes you a disciple. I hope you find the uh, message today to be thought-provoking, motivating, and encouraging, not discouraging. Some messages, including some of mine, can leave one with a feeling of, I'll never be able to do that. Woe is me. I fall so far short. God must be so unhappy with me. I don't want that to be, I don't want this to be that kind of message. If it does leave you that way, let me know, and I'll redo it somehow. Having said that, I must still speak what the Bible has to say on the topic. Now, once again, you can download this message or the transcripts of the message off the web transcripts, lightontherock.com. If that makes it easier to follow along, that's lightontherock.com. This was a Bible study I did for my own correction and learning, as usual, and I felt others may get as much out of it as I did. So here goes. Point number one, sign number one. A disciple, a disciple is not above his teacher. It says in Luke 6.40. Turn over uh, to Luke 6.40 with me. Luke 6.40. Luke 6.40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. A disciple 
is somebody who uh, is perfectly trained to be just like his teacher. Isn't that something? So a disciple, in fact, in fact, that's kind of repeated in Matthew 10.25. Let me see what that says. Matthew 10.25. Another passage that has something to do with that. Matthew 10.25. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant to be like his master. Okay? A disciple should be, point number one, like his teacher. Matthew 10, 25. Disciple, in fact, means learner. That's what it means. The Greek word, mathetes, if I'm saying that right, I may, may not be pronouncing that right. I didn't put the grammatical uh, signs there. But it means a learner. From mantano, to learn. The word is found in the Bible only in uh, Gospel and Acts. I'm quoting here from the Standard Bible Encyclopedia <clears throat> for the word disciple. Uh, but uh, continuing the quote, it says, But it is good Greek and used from Herodotus down and always means the pupil of someone, in contrast to being the master or teacher, which the uh, Greek word was didaskalos. And, Matthew's, and then it says, In all cases, it implies that the person not only accepts the views of the teacher, accepts them, but that he also in practice he's also in practice an adherent. He follows it. The word has several applications. In the widest sense to refer to those who accept the teachings of anyone, not only in belief, but in their life. We would say today, of course, uh, I'm not reading now, that they not only talk the talk, but they walk the walk. Continuing the quote, it says it is the only name used for Christ Christ followers in the Gospels. So, disciple means learner. A real disciple's learning about his master. I'm finished the quote now. In every way, he knows the details about his master and follows him implicitly. A true disciple wants to be like his master in every way. In fact, our English word disciple comes from a Latin word, not from the Greek word, but from the Latin word uh, discipulus, which means a, a scholar. Um, and from this word, we get the word discipline. Many of us think of discipline as punishment, but in its full meaning, it is so much more than just keeping people in mind. We ask today, what discipline are you following? Meaning, what form of teaching are you part of? What are you studying for? What, uh, what are you preparing to teach? What are you preparing to be? What discipline are you in? That's a, a, a form of the word that we don't often use, but um, at least uh, unless we're in the scholarly circles. How can we walk as someone walk unless we constantly walk with him and study his every move, every thought, every belief, and make it a part of us? You know, even in military affairs, when one wants to know his opponent intimately, not just military, but also in sports, it's this way. They, they watch the training films and the games, uh, films of the games of their opponent, and they analyze and watch and see every move that the opponent makes. But certainly in war, it's that way. Uh, if a person uh, is a general and you're going up against him, you're going to read everything you can about that person. In the movie Patton, uh, when Patton defeats Rommel, he exults, Rommel, I read, I read your book. I read your book, Rommel. In other words, Patton is saying, I know all about you, your strategies, your thinking, because I've studied you. I've studied you. How much more should we be studying the master we serve? He's not an opponent. He's not a rival. He's not an opposing team. He's the captain of our salvation. Now, we're called, brethren, to be professional Bible scholars. Professional in the sense that we take it very seriously and get very good at it. This means constant learning. As we grow in love for our master, it will become easier and easier to want to learn every nuance about him his preferences, his lifestyle, his thoughts, his way, in every way, just like a young woman in love with her fiancé. That's where we are in the scheme of things. We're the young woman. He's the fiancé, as I did in my series about Christ and the church, the, the bride and so forth, the bride and groom. We learn what he likes to eat. We learn where he likes to go. I'm talking about a young woman and her fiancé. What pleases him, what's not pleasing to him. And we should be the same way, becoming learners of Jesus Christ. As Rommel wrote a book, so did our Master. We have his book. Are we reading it? And he's our Master. He's not a rival. 
That book, the Bible, tells us everything he wants us to know about him. Please hear my message about the daily manna, and you'll see what I mean. I gave a message called Daily Manna, likening it to Bible study. The early disciples, who became the twelve apostles, had learned so much from Jesus that, turn with me to Acts 4.13, I want to show you something here. In Acts 4, verse 13. They had learned so much from Jesus that the learned men of their time were amazed at what these poor fishermen and tax collectors knew. Matthew, remember, was a tax collector. In Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, not many mighty are called, not many wise, remember, they marveled. These guys didn't go to divinity school. And they realized that they had been with Jesus who certainly was a great teacher, the greatest of all. He was God after all. He, he wrote the book. Would people say that about you and me? Would they realize after questioning us and talking to us and seeing our boldness, our openness, our openness about being a follower of Jesus Christ as those early disciples were, would they realize that we had been with Jesus or with the Word of God after a conversation with us one of the highest compliments you can get is if somebody that knows you, a neighbor, a friend, eventually makes a comment that they see in your conduct and in your words uh, uh, just a thrill to be a Christian, a thrill to be a follower, a believer. I know I'm trying to do that more and more in my life, in my field, in my profession. I confess my Savior. I confess His healing. I confess His answers to my prayer. I talk about him on many visits I have in people's homes. I'm not ashamed of him. I love him with all my being. Now the early disciples were so eager to learn that they would even ask Jesus to teach them various things. You can find scriptures where they ask him, for example, to explain many parables. You can go to Matthew 13, the, the parable of the sower. They asked him, hey, tell us what that meant. Tell us what that, what that has to do with anything. And other, other parables. And he, they asked him to he had, they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. In Luke 11, 1, Lord, teach us how to pray, like John taught his disciples, and so on. We have many examples of that. Have you been asking Jesus to teach you and show you his truth? We can show God we're just as eager to learn by sticking our noses into his book every chance we get. Turn with me now to Matthew 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. I, I recommend that we get in the habit while, while praying to actually say the words, to say the actual words, Father, teach me. Help me be teachable. Help me want to come sit at your feet. And then be specific about the areas you know that you need to learn more about. You may not like the way he teaches you, though, I'll warn you. Sometimes it's by circumstances that he uses to teach us. So be prepared for an answer. He doesn't just open our mind. He, sometimes uh, we, we learn by experiences to uh, avoid the bad way. I know I hope I'm learning some of that. I've sure gone the wrong way enough times. I don't want to keep going there. It's like the wise old man who was asked by a reporter. He said, what's the secret to your success? And he says, uh, the secret is learning to make wise judgments and decisions. And the young man said, well, how do you learn to make wise judgments and decisions? He said, by learning from the bad ones, bad judgments and decisions you make. <laughs> the key word is learning from. That's what we are. We're learners. We're disciples. Remember, that's what disciple means. A point number one, you're a learner of the master, learner of his way. Now, true disciples, therefore, are teachable, and they want to learn. Now, don't confuse teachable with just swallowing anything that's presented to you, though. True disciples are like the noble Bereans. They'll check out what's being said against Scripture before they accept it as truth. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. They were called noble for that. Noble Bereans. Now I ask you to turn to Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29. Here Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My question is, are we learning? Are we growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of his righteousness, and of his way? 
As we do, we let his mind be in us. As Paul urges in Philippians 2.5, let this mind, Philippians 2.5, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As we learn of him and read and study. Now turn with me to Luke 10.39. In Luke 10.39... Luke 10, 39. Another fascinating passage here. Women are uh, supposed to be learners too, not just the men. In Jesus' day, the women were kept separate. Even at the temple, they had the court of the, uh, for the men and the court for the women and so forth. A good woman didn't even try to learn. She did the uh, women's chores and served the men. The men were supposed to be the disciples and the followers and the learners. When Jesus came along, it was very, very unusual. I'm going to do a, a message just for you women, and I hope you'll find it inspiring and, and, and uh, uplifting. Maybe men ought to hear it too. Uh, when Jesus came as a, as a rabbi, he, he broke several taboos, or he caused he said, an uproar because uh, the rabbis in his day weren't supposed to even talk to women, uh, not even their own wives. And... Uh, in public, and yet Jesus had women followers. Uh, he, he was breaking a lot of taboos. There's a story, here's a story here where Jesus encourages women to learn. Matt, uh, in Luke 10, Luke 10, 39, and she had a sister called Mary. I'm breaking right into the story. He also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Therefore tell her to come help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, probably said Martha, Martha, <laughs> that's probably the tone he said it in, you're worried and you're troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. One thing, Mary. Notice what he's saying. There's one thing we need. Okay, the coffee can wait. The hors d'oeuvres can wait. One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, what did Mary do again? What was the one thing Mary did? She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. We... We can sit at the Master's feet any time we wish. We can open his book. We can let him speak to us. We can, like Mary, hear his words today just as clearly. Any time we wish. Mary is the one we, we, we remember for the good here. Incidentally, another scene with the two sisters, with the two sisters is found in John 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. John 12. I won't turn there. Where, when Mary anointed Jesus' feet, and it even says there, even there, that Martha served. But this time, though, Martha seems to have learned the lesson of not interfering with what her more passionate sister was doing and, and desire to honor, love, and revere her master. She knew, of, I think she had a feeling of what was coming. She was anointing him. And wiping it with her hair, of her, uh, with her hair of her head, and what a glorious thing she was doing, honoring and oiling and respecting her her master. Now, the main way we learn today is by daily Bible study. Think about it: the Old Testament disciples, if you want to call them that, were the children of Israel. They were forced to gather their manna first thing every single day because if they didn't, it would melt. They couldn't do it later. They couldn't skip days or weeks because it was only enough for a day and then it bred worms and went bad. And if they got up too late in the day, the manna was gone because it had melted. Hear my uh, message on manna because uh, I go into a lot of detail there. And uh, But if you didn't gather, you starved. So our manna today is Jesus. He said so. He said, I'm the bread from heaven in context in John 6, in context with the, the story, the, the discussion was all about manna. Uh, he was born in Bethlehem. That meant house of bread. Bethlehem means house of bread. Eat of me, he said. The Bible is Jesus in print. The lesson's clear. We, we better be eating of Jesus first thing every day, or we become malnourished. The opportunity can melt away, and we eventually become subject to infection from wrong doctrine, and we die malnourished. We die spiritually. And so our priority is to be regularly, often into God's Word directly, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to His Word by reading the Word, 
and not just in sermon tapes. That's a form of the word. Yes, it is. Not just, I'm saying. I'm not saying don't ever hear sermon tapes. I mean, this is a sermon tape, a message tape. Uh, not just articles, not just what men say about God's Word, but have your mind directly in God's Word yourself, day by day. We have an opportunity here that the early disciples themselves didn't have. They didn't have the Bible in print that they could tuck under their arm and carry around with them and, and throw in the back seat of the car and, and grab it during lunch or whatever. They didn't have that opportunity. The Bible was expensive, very, very expensive. Like buying a house back then, that's what I've heard. I mean, each book of the Bible had to be copied word for word in this, these big scrolls. I've seen them. And the expense was enormous. So normally a town just had one set of the Bible at the synagogue. So uh, today, though, we have it. We have it available. Too much is given, much is required. And so the point is this. Point number one, we're learning because we're learners of God, followers of God. We enjoy hearing Jesus' word. I'll even listen to Bible tapes as I play the, that I can play in the car as I drive around. We know more today than we did yesterday. We enjoy Bible studies. We enjoy hearing what the Master has to say. We want to learn more. We ask God to teach us. We're followers. We're teachable. That's point number one. Disciples are followers and learners of Jesus Christ. So much so that when people meet us and talk to us, they will marvel and they will know that we have been with Jesus Christ because of what we know and because of our lifestyle and the way we're walking. That leads us very directly into a more pointed wording of what I just said for point two. Let's uh, read John 8. If you turn with me to John chapter 8, verse 30. We'll start in John 8, 30. John 8, verse 30, for the second point. As he spoke those words, many believed in him. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, Here it is, another sign of a disciple, John 8, 31 now. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you keep, abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So point number two. In fact, before I, I say the point, I'm going to say what it says here in another translation of the same verse. It says, you are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings. That's a paraphrase of it. Keep obeying my teachings. Abide in my word. True disciples obey. Here's point number two. True disciples, and if we are true disciples, we'll be doing this. Obey and do what the Master says to do. Jesus is Lord of their lives. We say yes, sir, to everything he says. Everything he says. I'm not saying any of us do. But I'm saying the, the more we do so, the more we're an actual disciple. We're walking the walk at that point. Turn now with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're walking the walk, brethren, or else we're not truly we're not truly disciples. And I'm not talking about going back to anybody you heard about or knew did something five years ago or two years ago or 20 years ago or yesterday. I'm talking about the walk that we're walking today. And of course, we have to have a pattern. We have to have a track record of walking that walk. And so 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments, 1 John 2, verse 4 now, and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. By this we know we're in him. Here it is. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Remember that Jesus said the sign in John 8.31, If you abide in my word. Jesus is the word of God. That word is Christ. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. John 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> John 1.14. And the word became flesh. So we're talking about the Word. It says here that he who says he abides in him in the Word 
ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So a disciple, in other words, obeys and does what the master teaches and says, and we walk the same walk. Otherwise, we're phony. We've all been phony at times. I've been phony at times. We all have been. And we've got to put that behind us and start walking the walk more perfectly, more consistently. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Are we seeing growth in our desire to obey God? Are we at least seeing the areas that are weaknesses be areas that we don't want to be weak in our lives? We don't like those things anymore. The things We hate those things. Hating them is not enough. Paul said, the things which I hate, I still do. He says that in Romans 7. But we need to be seeing some growth in our desire to obey God, in the areas especially uh, that are our pet sins. What commands are we still refusing to obey? What sin do we coddle up to and hide? What is our bowl of lentils for which we could give up everything, like Esau did? We all have them, and we need to understand in the end, true disciples are obedient. True disciples are obeyers. Sometimes some of us have put down the need to obey, or some people in the, in the Christian community put down the need to obey. They say those who focus on, on obedience are legalists. That's what they call them. And uh, they tend to focus just on having a love for God and that he'll do everything else. And brethren, I, I'll be talking about love even in this message. But we must obey. We must know we're not uh, saved by our obedience, by works. We're saved by grace. But we've been called to obey once we've been called to salvation. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. We're saved by grace, but called to be his workmanship for good works. And to obey after we've been saved by grace. So there are just too many verses that speak of the need to now obey God. I could give you probably 20 or 30. I won't go through them now. But uh, there are many, many verses in the Bible, and I think most of you hearing this understand that, that say we must obey God. But the point I want to get to is the fact that I think many of us obey God in the things that we find easy to obey Him in, but there are lots of commands in the Bibles, in the Bible that I see in my life, I see in others' lives, uh, where, where we, we, we aren't so eager to obey that verse or this other verse. We pick and choose. A true disciple wants to be perfectly trained and follow him. In John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. So uh, there are just too many verses that talk about obedience. And love is proven by obedience. In 1 John chapter 5, 1 to 3, in fact, I remember when my oldest daughter was a young girl, and she had done something that just made me really frustrated because she, she wasn't uh, at that particular time being obedient. Uh, she's been a, a wonderful daughter, but uh, at that particular time she was falling short. And as I disciplined her and talked to her and, and corrected her, she said to me with tears in her eyes, I don't know how old she was, uh, six or seven or five or something, she said, uh, Daddy, I love you. And I should have just hugged her, I suppose, at that moment, but I was so frustrated. I don't think I spanked her or anything, but I was just upset. And I blurted out without even thinking what I was saying, but when I blurted it out, it became really clear to me what this verse, if you love me, keep my commandments. She said, Daddy, but I love you. And then I said, well, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, do what I say. And all of a sudden, it was like bells were going off, and God was saying, Philip, if you love me, obey me. Philip, practice what you're saying to your own daughter. If you say you love me, obey me. Do what, do what I'm telling you to do in God's Word. Because so many of us have areas in God's Word that we don't fully submit our lives to. You know it and I know it. A true disciple is going to submit in those areas. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Now here we go. 1 John 5, verse 2. By this we know, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. If you say you love God, do what Jesus Christ said. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. A good cross-reference for the one I'm reading now. 1 John 5, 3. This is, this is the love of God. 
This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. And yet there are Christians out there who will teach you that we don't have to keep the commandments. Remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan after he had fasted 40 days? He said we need to live by every word of God. Every. Live by and every. Are the key words here? Every word of God. Every word. The whole Bible. We don't just believe the doctrine of the Bible, but we live by, we live by, we live by the Word of God. I'm going to keep saying it. We live by the things in the Word of God. Even the hard stuff to live by. Things like truly loving your wife, even when you feel that it's hard to love her. Things like showing her we trust her and love her and adore her. Things like giving her some space and living considerately with her, with respect. Things like overcoming our pride, our lack of submission to one another. Things like wives really submitting to your husbands and honoring them as to Christ himself. These are actual verses, you know, in the Bible. Things like finally overcoming alcoholism. Some of God's people drink too much, frankly, and get drunk. That is a crying shame. Gluttony. I speak to myself here. I know how hard that is for me. To, to overcome the weight I have, and I guess I'm eating too much. Gluttons don't like to admit that. Overweight people don't like to admit that. Hey, I'm one of you. I'm overweight. And I've got to watch my, my weight. I've joined Weight Watchers, and uh, the, the main message is portion control. That's just a nice way of saying quit eating so much, quit being a glutton. But the key word is portion control, along with exercise and so forth. How about covetousness? For some of us, it's sexual lust. For others, it's a grasping for materialism. For still others, it could be loving the world too much. I think all of us have that in, our, in, our, in us that we don't even recognize. We like to say we don't love the world, but then we, we love uh, you know, watching the, the world's movies and being entertained by it. And I find myself in the same boat. It's hard to come out of the world. Are we going to obey or not is the, is the, is the question I'm asking. You and I can claim to be disciples because we claim a superior knowledge of the truth or the truths of God. And yet if we aren't walking the walk, living the way, nobody will care about the fact that we have correct doctrine. Nobody will be impressed by the fact that we understand some things that others don't unless they see it in our lives and their interactions with us, unless they see in the way we deal with people, starting with our very own loved ones, our, our wife, our husband, our children, and the way we interact with people when we get double-crossed and cheated, when we're, when we're delayed, when we're not being treated fairly. And that walk is all-inclusive. It means we're obeying the verses also about being gentle with one another. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known to all men, one verse says about honoring the king, the president, whoever he may be, whatever party he's from. Honor the king, Peter said. I think that's in First Peter. And he also, another place, says, honor all men, esteeming others better than yourselves, another verse. That's hard to do, isn't it? Praying for those who hate us and despise us. Praying for them, for them. Asking God to forgive them. Asking God not to hold it to their to their a sin to their record. Truly forgiving them from the heart. Truly forgiving those who have really badly hurt us and others, who, and others we care about. These, these are some of the harder things for us to come to, to do, for some of us to do, to be, to be walking in. Living by every word means to be repenting of the sins that are rooted in parts of our lives. You know where those sins are and what they are. You know what your secret sins are. There are no secret sins. Brethren, have you realized that when you and I do something, if, if we're eating too much, if we're gossiping, if we're getting drunk, if we're lusting, if we're doing anything sinful and not keeping check on ourselves, it's not being done secretly. There are millions and millions and millions of angels out there who are watching. God's watching. Twenty-four elders are watching. 
The living creatures around the throne are watching. And like I said, millions, hundreds of millions of angels are watching. Your guardian angel certainly is watching. The one who comes back and forth between God. And we want him to go back with a, with a report about the good things that he sees, the growth he sees, the fact we are walking as, as a disciple, the fact that we are a light to the world. Brethren, I'm tired of not being a light. In my past, I don't want to keep doing that, not being a light. I want to be a good light. I want to be an example. I want to be a disciple. I want people to know when they talk to me and talk to you, we have been with Christ. We can't go on living a lifestyle of sin, sinful sins, secret sins, and call ourselves disciples of the Holy One. And how can we live by every word if we don't know every word? That goes back to point one, doesn't it? That they were learners of Christ. If we're not studying every word, if we're not learning every word, which was sign number one, we get up early in the morning and we read it, we learn it, we put it in our heads, we pray with it. Turn now to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like good people, in other words. Verse 16, You will know them by their fruits. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Not everyone will be in the kingdom, but the ones who do the will of God, the ones who obey God, will be in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say that those who don't, he's going to tell them to depart from him, you who practice lawlessness. This is very serious. If we're harboring and practicing unrepentant sin, God could say the very same thing to us, that he never knew us. How embarrassing, how terribly devastating, how horrifying that would be, and what a terrible impact and result that would be. I want to hear the positive the very positive words from my king, my husband, my savior. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and inherit the kingdom my father has prepared for you. Luke 6, Luke 6, verses 46 to 49. Our learning must produce a life that's built on Jesus Christ. Luke 6, 46 to 49. Let me turn over there, Luke 6. Verses 46 to 49. Our learning must produce a life built on Jesus Christ. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things which I say? How good it is to know the Lord, many Christians will say. How good it is to know the Lord. And then they go on out and gamble. They go on out and use his name in vain. Are we that way? Whoever comes to me, he says, and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods arose, Jesus was a house builder, remember. He knows all about this. He is like a man building a house, okay, and, when the, and builds on the rock. You know why we call this, this little service I do, the light on the rock? Because Jesus is that rock. And he is also that light. And we are to be a light. We let him shine in us. Not reflecting him, but him shining in us, out of, out of us. We don't want to just reflect him. We want him in us. We want it to be his light. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house. Could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. On the rock. Not just any rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently and it immediately fell, and the ruin of the house was very great. Now, in the end, when Jesus, in the end of Matthew 28, when he gives the commission to the disciples, the King James, King James says, go and teach all nations, and other, other translations say, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. Amen. 
So notice that they were disciples, they were to disciple the nations and teach them to observe the things Jesus commanded them. Now one key I found in the Bible to being a doer is to try to do it immediately when I hear something that I, I should do. James two, I mean James one verses twenty one to twenty five talks about that. Let's go on now to point number three. I want you to turn now to so point number two was uh, disciples do what their master says to do. They walk the walk. Point number one is they learn it. Point number two is they do it. Okay. Point number one is we're learners of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. We're studying his word. We're in, we have our nose in his word a lot. Point number two, we apply what we've learned and we live that life and we're overcoming. Yeah, we stumble just like the early disciples did. But we must as time goes by, grow in the grace and knowledge. We're not there all in one fell swoop, but we must be growing. Now, for the third sign of true disciples, turn to John 13, verses 34 to 35. John 13, verses 34 to 35. This is the one that many automatically think of as a sign of a true disciple, but you'll see, I hope you've seen already, that there are many other verses that just as clearly say that this makes you a disciple. Now, in John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. It's a new commandment. He says, love one another. As I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this what? By this love that uh, you have, all will know that you're my disciples, that you have for one another here. All will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So point number three is, or sign number three is, true disciples have a deep love for one another as Christ loved us in the same way as Christ loved us. That's what made it new, as you'll see. Isn't it wonderful to visit a home where you feel, you can feel the love of the husband and wife for each other. You can feel it. I think that's just so wonderful to be in a home like that, where the children and the parents love to be with each other. God's household, think of it, where the household of God must be the same, or those those who aren't that way are probably not part of the household. Okay? And we, the people who come to God's house must see a love there that just inspires, very, very inspiring to them to want to be a part of it and to have that same thing. I remember uh, a lady who was called years and years ago, became a part of the church I was pastoring, and um, a few months after she began attending with us, I got a phone call from another woman. She identified herself, I'm Mrs. So-and-so, and I said, she says, you don't know me, but uh, my sister so-and-so started attending with you and your church, and she has changed so much. She's become such a different person in a positive way that whatever you've done for her, I want you to do for me, she said. And I just chuckled. I said, I haven't done anything for her. I'm just the speaker of the Word. The Word of God is what's done it for her. She's a diligent studier of the Word, and she's putting to practice what she's reading. And uh, she's, you know, following the good example she has around her at church. And, and yes, you're invited, to, uh, welcome to come. And so she came and was eventually baptized. But I thought, what a, what a wonderful testimony. What a wonderful testimony that uh, I would get a call like that, and she says, this woman used to be so hateful, so mean and everything, and now she's so full of love. And I would like to be like, I, I, she says, I, I, I'm of the same family she was from. I was kind of like her, and I'd like to be like she is. And then I said, well, that's because she's becoming like her master, like Jesus Christ. And what a testimony to the work of Jesus in our lives, that, that others could feel and see the love. Now, some denominations or individual church groups, we see what? We see fighting and bickering, gossiping, backbiting. We see hurt feelings, jealousies, politicking, striving for position. These things make onlookers want nothing to do with a group like that. But when we see and feel the love, the joy, the peace, the getting along, the serving, we witness a meekness and a humor and a laughter and a camaraderie and a serving of one another and a joy to be with one another, tenderness and forgiving of one another, saying good things about one another, not gossip, giving up our time to serve and help one another. These, these must be the followers of Jesus Christ. 
would be your natural instinct when, when if you were in a group like that. I'm going to speak frankly here. Frankly, lately, God's people have not been very loving to each other as we've split up, as we, as we walked from the heresies, or maybe a more accurate way to put it is the heresies caused the part of the group we were all part of to walk, I mean, to, to walk away from God's truth. We stayed where we were, and they walked away with the heresies. We could no longer fellowship with the heresies and go worship God where a false God was being preached. And so we, we left that group, and what did we do? We went into different directions ourselves, into different church denominations and groups, to the point where some even started saying, if you're not part of our group, you're not part of it at all. Be here or nowhere, kind of a thing. Some people were advised not to not attend over there and not to go to their feast sites. It's not been a happy scene lately. You can decide to be one who won't let man-made walls and barriers keep you from reaching out to your brethren and other flocks. The true church is not an organization. The true church is not an organization of men with an incorporated name. The true church is known only by God as the people who have His Spirit, who are walking by His Spirit. And now this sign, showing love for one another, is nothing new. Jesus said, he says, a new commandment I give you, but, but listen carefully, it really, really wasn't new in the first part of it, because you can read Revel uh, Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18 says to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Jesus said, a new commandment, love one another. Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor as yourself, but he called it new. Why? Because he had a, he had a phrase in here. Okay, here's what he said. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Now that's what made it new. We are to love another in, a, in the same way, same manner, same attitude as Jesus' love is for us. That puts an entirely new light on it. It's easy to love those who love you. But Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. Jesus was asking Father to not charge his murderers with their sins before they even repented. This is the kind of love Jesus speaks of here. Here my passage or my message on, uh, on forgiveness, uh, forgiving one another as Christ forgave us. Very important passage to, to be studying and reading. The love spoken here in the Greek is agape. Agape, uh, unconditional spiritual love that had nothing to do with a person deserving the love or not. One of the best ways we can show our love is to forgive one another. And like I said about the message I have, Jesus' love is tireless, it's unconditional, it's perpetual, it's steady and dependable. But love isn't just a feeling. Love is proven by what we do for each other. Love is a verb in many cases. To put it another way, our love is proven by what we do to and for one another. In John 15, verses 12 to 13, John 15, verses 12 to 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Now laying down our lives, I want to give you the homework to think about that. What does that mean to lay down your life? You know, our time is our life for one thing. When we give up our time to serve others, that's laying down our lives. If we're willing to literally die for one another, that's laying down our lives. Life is also giving up uh, demands to be right all the time. I heard someone speaking the other day who talked about how so many, and me included, have to be right. So we end up in an argument, or people being corrected over some trivial thing because they didn't say something quite 100% right, or pronounce a word correctly, or use the right syntax, or whatever, just to be silly about it, so we feel we have to say something. That doesn't end in love, brethren. I've been guilty of that all too often. I'm talking about trivial things, not life and death issues about right and wrong. That's what I'm talking about. It's giving in to what's important to someone else, not insisting on what we want. Of course, we can't say we love someone and go gossiping about them either. We have to protect that person, protect her honor. We don't, ex we don't accuse or repeat their sins, for that's of the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. James tells us that true disciples will speak evil of no one. Boy, how often we do that, speak evil of one another. 
And I've done it. And we've got to stop doing it because that's not the love of God. That's not the love of God. That's of Satan the accuser. And when someone's accusing you of anyone, if you hear bad things about anyone who is a child of God, you know who you're listening to. You're listening to Satan, not God. God says, I forgive you. God says, I love you. God says, come to me. God says, I won't turn you away. Satan says, yeah, but do you know what he did? Do you know what she did? Do you know what she's like? We know that God must love us because he sure forgives us our failings and sins, even the super bad unspeakable sins we've committed that we've repented of. We can't undo by ourselves. The bell can't be unrung. We can't unring the bell of our sins. We, we need God to forgive that and understand it. And we need to be as his people forgiving and understanding of others who have done the same thing. If you're aware of someone who's an alcoholic and is trying to overcome it, is overcoming it, or someone who is a homosexual is trying to beat it and overcome it, brethren, we have to understand that. We, we don't want to be thinking of that person as, here comes a homosexual, here comes a liar, here comes a whatever. We're all sinners before God. Now cleansed and forgiven, listen to the message I have on being new. Because that is such an inspiring concept to me that God sees me new. I need to be new. So do you. I need people to understand that about me, and I need to understand that about you. You are what you are. Your history can't be relived. It's happened. And I have to live with it, and so do you. But your history, your lifestyle, from the, every, from the moment you were born to what you are today, everything that's happened to you, everything that you've done, is what makes you the rich person you are today the wonderful person you are today. That's what makes you the unique person you are today. And we can show our love for our brothers and sisters by forgiving and forgetting, brethren, their failings, letting God be their judge. Are you known as a forgiver or a repeater of sins, a whisperer, a person who can't forgive someone some evil you've heard about them? God is love. And his body, the church, is going to be loved too. God forgives and forgets. And his body, the church, forgives and forgets too. God gives people another chance. Many times, in fact, day by day, God's body, you and I, will give people another crack at a good reputation also. God's body remembers the words of our Lord, let him who is without sin go cast the first stone. And many of us who are accusers like to say, yeah, but he said go and sin no more to that same woman. What if the woman had committed adultery again a few months later and come to him? Would he not have forgiven him? Forgiven her? Of course he would have. How many of us have only sinned one sin one time on a particular sin? Or do we not call them, in fact, our weaknesses? They're weaknesses because we do them over and over. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, we have to overcome those. <clears throat> But we can come to God. That's why he said, if a person comes to you 70 times 7, you forgive him. In one day, he said, at one point, 7 times in a day. And yet we've been taught, hear my message on forgiveness. It's so important that we learn this. But so many who claim to be Christians are stone throwers. We carry a stone in our, in our hands. We're ready with it. We're finger pointers, whisperers, separating the very body from others who have repented. That's of Satan. Sometimes this command to love is hardest at home. <clears throat> we can be so tough and gruff and unloving, unserving, sometimes most of all to our wives, so to our husbands. But we'll bend over backwards if a brother outside needs help, but we can't do something simple for our own wife or our own, our own husband. Domineering, domineering, bossy, catty, whatever the situation is, that's not of God. Love starts first right here in the home. And remember that the love isn't just for each other. He's, and Jesus taught us in Matthew 5 to love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's Matthew 5, to 46. So part of the very trademark of having a deep love for one another is a oneness. Oneness also. That goes to the very soul of the group. We are one. We are one with God, one with Christ. Turn with me to John 17. One with each other. I think we have a ways to go on that one. John 17, this is where Jesus is praying at the end of introducing the bread and the wine and the foot washing. He now prays to God in heaven, his Father and our Father. 
And he starts with a prayer about himself. And then he says in John 17, 20, after he starts talking about the disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, John 17, 20, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's praying for us there. At that moment, he's praying for us. He says, I pray also for those who will believe through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory, John 17:22, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Hold it, hold it a minute. One just as Father and Jesus are one. How awesome is that? He says, that's what I want my disciples to be. That's what I want my disciples to be like, as one as you and I are one, Father. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in me, that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That the world may know. That the world may know. Then in verses 25 and 26, where this oneness is evidenced once again by profound love, a deep caring for one another, O righteous Father, he says, the world hasn't known you, but I've known you, and these have, not, these have known that you sent me. And I've declared to them your name, and I, de I will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them. He prayed for you and me that the love that he has for us, that he has for us, and the love that God loved Jesus with may be in them for each other, and back to God again, and I in them. He said, please, please let me be in them. God is love. And if God is in you, like Jesus prayed, love is in you as a true disciple. It's that simple. This love is evidence in an obedience for God, which we already saw in point two, but it's also the kind of love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Agape love does not envy, is not proud, does not delight in evil, keeps no score of wrongs, and so on. Let's try to put point number three into everyday practice. Love is proven by our conduct for one another. It's a respect that we have for people, even for children, and their feelings and their needs. We prove it by supporting, edifying, propping up one another, not by tearing down. We prove it by our words. Our words are so powerful. Our words can tear down or lift up. Our words can make someone want to live or want to die. We need to be people finding our other people doing things good and right and mentioning it to them and complimenting and thanking them for the good they do. You know, when you tell someone how they motivated you, how they influenced you, how, how wonderful something was, that will motivate them far more to more good actions than pointing out the wrong all the time ever will be. Verbalize your love. Tell your son you love him. Hug your daughter. And, and tell people you appreciate them. Turn your heart to your children. Get up off the, t off the couch and the, turn off the TV and go play a round of basketball with your son. Pray with your daughter as you tuck her in bed. And, and, and let them hear you say that you're proud of her, proud of him. Hug your daughter. Turn your heart to hers. Show your kindness to your kids. A true disciple oozes positive agape love, a joy, a feeling of being edified when you're in the presence of a true disciple. <clears throat> Why are so many of God's people so often so dour? What's up with that? So anyway, be a blessing wherever you go. Let people know you're, by your bright conduct that Jesus is in you. Let people know when they come to our churches that there is a love of God there too. Sign number three, disciples love one another in the same unconditional agape way that Jesus loves people. Sign number four, John 15, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire, it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. <clears throat> John 15, 7 and 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, that makes you a disciple, he says. Another sign. The New Living Translation paraphrase says, My true disciples produce much fruit. And that's so true. So point number four, true disciples bear much fruit. And they don't just bear fruit, they bear much fruit. If we don't bear any fruit, we know we're going to be pruned down pretty severely and eventually rooted up and thrown out and burned. 
we recently did a tour of some wineries and to learn about the vineyards, and we learned a lot about vineyards and grapevines. One thing we learned is that too much sun and water produces a lot of fruit, but not good fruit. The vine dresser told us that the grapevines put down the deepest and strongest roots and produce the best fruit when the vine is experiencing some hardship, maybe a lack of rain for a time. And I immediately thought of trials that God allows us to go through knowing that we will send down strong roots or knowing that they will attach ourselves to the root that is Christ, the vine that is Christ during that time of trial, and that we'll bear good fruit at the end of it all. Fruit's not the same as growth. Bearing fruit's not the same thing as growing. Growth comes before fruit, usually. But if all we have is growth, that won't be enough. Remember the fig tree that was full of leaves and no fruit? And, of course, fruit is the evidence of being the body of Christ. It's a fruit that is the evidence in our lives of productive ways that help, that feed people what they need. It's the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that sustains and feeds, nourishes and strengthens and gives life to people. So how do we bear much fruit? John 15:1 to 5 gives us the answer, especially in verse 5, which I'll jump to for time's sake. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If you abide in him, hang on to him, attach to him, go to him. And see how this all ties back into point one and two and three, being a learner and studier of his way and then walking that walk and abiding in him. In Matthew 13, the parable of the sower is another big one on, on fruit bearing. I hope you know it. Matthew 13, 18 to 23. Matthew 13, 18 to 23, talks about different kinds of ground that receives the seed in different ways. And he says the good ground is the one who receives the word of God and understands it. He receives it and understands it and bears fruit and produces 100 times, 60 times, and 30 times. Now that's a lot of fruit. The key was being open to God's implanted word is being planted, being sown, being receptive to it. We don't want to be like the waste, the wayside uh, ground uh, because uh, that, that ground was hard, and, and that's a sinful heart that hardens hearts. The stony ground are people who are shallow, no place for the roots to go. They like the church for the socials, the friends, the shallow things, for the good times. But when the hardships come and the trials and sorrows abound, they stumble and don't produce. We don't want to, we don't want to be that either. The thorny ground crowd are those, and once again, too many of us who either are pursuing the better things in lives, riches and a better income, or they worry about the cares of this life. It says the cares of this life choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Thorns and weeds don't grow up quickly. They, they come gradually, brethren. Now, listen here. Ground is what it is. Someone works until someone works with it. Ground can't change itself by itself. Ground is usually produced from an outside influence, and it's usually made better or worse. In the same way, we are what we are until God works in us. If we see that we're thorny ground, being distracted by the things of the world and cares of this life, or if we see we're the rocky ground, shallow and not deep enough, going to church for the social and the fellowship, not much else, and we need to ask the ground tiller, the ground maker, we need to ask the groundsman, the vineyard, the vine dresser, to come and work with this ground that we are, to soften us up, to tear out a few weeds, to dig up some of those rocks, and make us good ground. God is the one who does it. We have to be the ones who ask. A person who is full of ground can't change itself, brethren. God changes us, but we have to be receptive to that change. A person who is full of godly fruit is humble like an apple branch heavy with fruit its branches full of apples hanging down to the low to the ground it benefits other people it's a giver it's a server so look at your harvest basket of fruit of service and the fruit of God's spirit being used to help other people is the basket brimming with good fruit or are there just two or three fruit in there and it's empty otherwise brethren if it's empty it's a sign that we're not attached to the vine or it's a sign that our ground is not good ground. And we need to ask the groundsman to work with this ground that we are. Finally, point number five, a true disciple takes up his cross and follows Christ to the end, never giving up. Being a disciple does entail carrying your cross. 
Luke 14, verses 26 to 20 to 33. Luke 14, 26 to 33. If anyone comes to me, being a disciple, in other words, is not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be a party. Being a disciple is going to mean that some of us are going to die in the years ahead. Some of us are going to be martyred and tortured and persecuted in the years ahead. Some of us, many of us, will have tribulations and trials. Luke 14, 26 to 33 talks about we have to love God more than our father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even more than our own life. Or you cannot be my disciple, Luke 14, 26. And whoever doesn't bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We better count the cost, he says. And then he ends with verse 33. Read all it yourself. So likewise, whoever of you who doesn't forsake all that he has, in context enduring to the end, cannot be my disciple. Sometimes Jesus said things that offended some of his early disciples and they left him. Like we can read at the end of John 6, they were offended. And some looked back. Remember Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Luke 9.62. Luke 9.62. We must not keep looking back. Must not be wondering what we could have done with all that tithe money if we had we only invested it. That's looking back. We must focus on the one goal of the kingdom, walking with our master till we're there. We must follow him and deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Remember the cross represents, brethren, a lot of things. It represents death, dying to the self. It represents suffering and shame and sacrifice. The cross represents self-denial, giving yourself for others. The cross represents a supreme love. It represents also excruciating pain. That's where we get the word excruciating from. Excruciating means pain. Originally meant pain like that one would endure from being crucified. Excruciating. And we're going to have some mental and physical excruciating pain being a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. We are. So what does carrying your cross represent? All of that. Crosses aren't very convenient. Crosses aren't very nice. They're not very beautiful. They didn't certainly make you feel good or make you look good. I speak as a fool. The early disciples were often killed, in fact. Remember James? He was beheaded. So was Paul. So were many thousands and thousands of others. And we can read in Acts 8 that there was a strong persecution after Stephen's martyrdom. Acts 8, 1 to 4, after uh, Stephen was killed at that time, a great persecution. Acts 8, verse 1 and, uh, and onwards. A great persecution arose against the churches which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then Saul, verse 3, made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere hiding. No, they went everywhere preaching the word. They weren't secret disciples. Great persecution. That time's coming again. A time worse than that, because Jesus said there will be a time of trouble worse than you've ever, ever seen before in your whole life. If it were illegal to be a disciple of Christ, would there be enough obvious evidence against you and me to convict us? He says they were scattered. That means they lost their jobs, their homes, and their families. Are you ready for that? It's coming again. You better get ready. Are you ready for jail time because you're a true believer and having false things said about you? You better be ready because it's coming. Don't think we're going to have it easy, this easy all the time. We're just not. In Acts 14, 21, 22, Paul said we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So the time is coming when it will get harder and harder to be a disciple. And if your very life was imperiled by being a follower of the way, would you still be a, a true disciple? There are Muslims in the Sudan who are killing, raping, pillaging the Christian black population, for example. In many countries, especially Muslim countries, it's dangerous, illegal, in fact, to be a Christian. You can be beheaded for it, jailed for it. Your church or meeting place can be bombed and people get killed. We read of that in the news once in a while in Pakistan and other places. You can be jailed for bringing in a Bible into the country. But there are people who are doing that very thing to get God's word to people who have never seen or heard of it. 
if that kind of condition started over here in our country, where you, where you and I could be tortured for professing Christ, would we endure to the end? I want us to really think about it. Take up your cross daily. Follow Christ. Be disciples of Christ. So what are the proofs, the signs of a true modern-day disciple? They are Bible students. Number one, followers of the Word. Followers, learners of Christ. They pray and study regularly. They, they're serving one master. Point number two, disciples obey their master. They do what he says. And even the things that are secret sins and weaknesses, those have to go and we're doing what Christ says. Point number three, disciples are loving, forgiving people to each other and their families, their spouse, to even their enemies. They're a gentle people. Would your wife say you're a gentle person? Would your husband say that? They, they should. Point number four, disciples are bearing much fruit, much fruit, growing and producing something for the benefit of others. Point number five, true disciples pick up their cross and stick with their master right to the very end. They never quit. We've been called by Jesus to be his disciples. What an honor that is. It's very special. Very few are being called right now, but you have been. Cherish that calling. If we don't fulfill our calling as disciples, others will be called. We'll lose our spot. Let no one take your crown. In fact, I may follow this up with a study on cherishing our high calling. Now let's be sure we act and look like and we are those disciples we've been talking about, just as identifiable today as they would have been in the days of the book of Acts. With God's help and helping each other grow, we can be disciples God is well pleased with today. We've slipped a ways in the last few years, but we can wake up. We can get back in the life of being a disciple. What an awesome reward you and I will have if we'll just respond to this call to become true disciples of Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's all for now. Disciples, it's all for now. Have a wonderful day, modern day disciples. It's an honored calling, a high calling. Until next time, God be with you, with you always. This is Philip Shields saying goodbye.